All right, uh, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, in this uh, technical steering meeting, we'll talk about a couple of uh, topics. Specifically, we'll hear from Matteo Verola to talk about uh, a consolidated optical provider and proposal for that. And afterwards, we'll hear from Maya Khan David to, to um, have a discussion about some suggested uh, practices for, for this forum and for the PSD in general. All right. Normally we have shout outs in the beginning, but uh, none of us could think of uh, any part of standouts. Not that there are not any, it's just that probably indicates morning uh, uh, slowness on our part. And so we're going to skip that part unless somebody on the phone has suggestions. Going once, twice, twice. Okay. So um, with that, I'm going to hand over the reins to Matteo. Um, from your presentation rights, and um, we'll, we'll take it from there. All right, Matteo, you should be able to share your presentation. Great, you can see it. Yes, so you should hear me now also. Yes, yes, we can hear you nice and clear. Okay, perfect. There are only a couple of slides. I want to present you. Um, we have right now in CreateNet um, two different use cases involving two, two European projects. Uh, one is called Achino. I think you heard about it. And the other one is like is related to the, the giant activities that we have. Uh, as you know, in giant we have several activities related to Onos. And starting from, from January or something like that, um, we started to work on uh, um, a new case that we call transport use case that is very similar to the, to the Achino one. So here there's like a, um, a picture of, of the, I don't know uh, how to say that, I think we can say that it's the Achino vision. The, um, the, the main problem, the main issue that we have now is that um, we want to manage a multi-domain uh, uh, IP optical network with ONOS. Um, so we know that ONOS has a lot of southbound APIs, but for several um, type of devices, um, it's not possible to be con directly controlled and managed by ONOS. So if you look at this picture here, um, in Achino, we, uh, we, uh, we try to manage layer three um, routers, layer two routers, and also optical uh, devices. Um, in particular, with optical devices, right now we are working with two different vendors. One is Adva, and the other one is Infinera. <clears throat> in the optical domain, especially, so we, we don't see a lot of problem, a lot of issues, with layer two, layer two or layer three devices, you know that there are several protocols um, that we can use to directly manage the, the physical devices. But with the vendors that we are working on, um, we don't have the chance to directly work with the optical devices. And in fact, we think also that is good, uh, that this, this is something good um, because inside an optical domain, there's, there are a lot of uh, complexities that it's not so bad to, to be hidden. I mean, uh, if we have like a, um, an entity, a sort of a proxy, a sort of a controller that expose to us the devices, their features, and allow us to configure them without taking care of all the optical feasibilities and all the, um, all the information related, strictly related to the optical devices, it's easier for us. So, uh, right now, as I said before, we are working with with these two um, um, vendors, Adva and Infinera. Um, they are uh, exposing to us um, uh, their controller, their proprietary controller. On top of them, they have uh, created two uh, REST servers. Um, obviously, the, the implementation is uh, is different. And in the case of Infinera, we have an NDA that, and we, uh, I cannot share the uh, specific uh, REX processing, the, the, the information uh, with you, but I think this is not, not relevant. 
The important, the important stuff is that through this northbound, uh, we are able to get information about the topology and we are able to configure services on the optical uh, network. <clears throat> then we are working with, with Juniper and we are working with Corsa. With Corsa, obviously, we are working with the open flow, with open flow and everything is fine. With Juniper, we, we are working with NetCoff, SNMP, and it's fine too. Um, so, um, what we uh, what we added in the in the last months is what we call this REST proxy uh, southbound uh, provider and protocol, and obviously the proprietary driver for Adva and Infinera. Um, through this REST proxy. Um, provider, uh, we extended the standard REST provider to uh, be able to interact with a uh, second layer um, hypervisor that uh, expose more than one device. And so the current implementation is based on the honest REST provider and protocol. So we took, we exactly took the REST provider and protocol, we duplicated uh, them uh, and we created new bundles for the provider and protocols that we call REST proxy provider and REST proxy protocol. I don't want to go too much in detail because, as I said, this is the current implementation. Um, what we added is that we added two new behaviors that we call devices discovery and links discovery because uh, mm, differently from the standard REST provider and protocol, obviously right now we manage more devices under a single entity. So when we attach a new proxy, through this proxy we discover M devices and M links, obviously. Um, just to point out, the main issue that we, are right we have right now, so this stuff is working. <coughs> it's working both with, with Adva and with Infinera. And as I said before, we have two different implementation, two different drivers and so on. But the, the main logic is working for both of them. <coughs> The main issue that we have right now is not with the, the topology discovery, but is the um, is related to flow rules and flow objectives. Because uh, if we use the standard uh, intent compilation, when we create an honest intent, um, obviously we expose multiple devices to the honest core, and so the intent framework um, translates the intent into multiple flow rules or flow objectives. Uh, and so we receive in the driver the um, uh, the intent already decomposed, uh, and so we need to recompose the intent uh, into a single request to be made to the proxy. And ob and this is not not easy to be done uh, because we don't have a, an, um, a way to correlate the different flow flow rules or flow objectives. Okay, so. Why we are talking to you about that? So, as I said before, the implementation is done. We have the code. The code is working. is in our repository. And in fact, if you don't care about these use cases, that's all. But if you think that this provider and the uh, obviously the protocol will be useful for other use cases, or if you want to integrate it in, into Onos, uh, we have like two different approaches. We can. Um, still maintain it as a separate provider, so to have the Onos REST and the Onos REST proxy one, uh, and we can go through the uh, process of make this code better, and to and so the idea is to, to, to send the code to you and to be approved, uh, you know, all the get it stuff and so on. Um, or we can um, try to integrate the Onos, the, the proxy one, into the Onos REST southbound. So the idea is like to support in a single REST provider both the, the use case that you already supported plus this use case. So adding these new behaviors and um, changing the drivers and, and the logic based on the behavior supported by the, by the, the, the driver. Um, what about the intent? Last question. What about the intent? Uh, do you think that the intent domain will solve it, or do you have other suggestion except what you, Thomas, said to, to Michele, that is like um, to eventually uh, try to bypass the intent framework 
uh, and in our uh, for our scenario, um, as I said, bypass the intent and 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 instead of um, using the intent framework, send the intent directly to the to the provider and to the driver. Um, okay, that, that's all. If you have any question, obviously I am I can explain. I can go more in details, but I hope you understood uh, you understood the the, the yeah. use case. Yeah, I think I followed. So th there's two parts to this then, right? So the question of whether um, whether to merge the REST existing REST and REST proxy. And I think for this, I would leave uh, um, leave the decision to you. If you think there is enough commonality, um, then I would, you know, probably try to integrate it. But if you think that they're sufficiently distinct or sufficiently distinct use cases with with uh, just some code overlap, then maybe just partial refactoring, and you know, so that they, the share, the common code can be shared, but the uh, the distinct parts can be separate. Um, I, I would leave that decision up to you, uh, because you probably would be in a better position to make that uh, that call. Um, the second part is about the intents. So. Um, whether the intent domain will solve this sort of a dilemma. I mean, that, that was one of the goals for the intent domains is to allow um, to, to allow this sort of a thing. Now, strictly speaking, you should not require the intent domains for this. Uh, however, the current intent uh, system is um, the compilation results are expected to be flow rules and or flow objectives depending on the system setting. And so, Currently, there is really no way around this. This is unfortunately is sort of a, a binding. Is unfortunately, I think, a result of a um, eager optimization that happened a number of releases back, and as a result, it, uh, it created this coupling. Um, and so, I'm not sure that in in the interim on the existing uh, intent uh, framework, there's really a good way to solve this. At least, I can't think of anything. Anybody has any ideas? Please, 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 please uh, suggest them. I, I missed something. What's what's the actual issue? So today, so remember, in the old days, uh, the intent the intent compilers were producing <coughs> things down to installable intents, and then we had in, in, intent installers. So the thing, the installable thing, was an installable intent, right. which was a high level abstraction. Sure. However, through the process of you know optimizing and hunting down performance and all of that stuff, and we decided, okay, we don't need intent compilers. We just reduced everything now, and the insoluble things became insoluble flow rules and flow objectives, and that is clearly far too low level of a construct. Mm -hmm. And that was a mistake. Clearly. Well, it, I mean, it, right. it's, it's fine when you have ONOS control over individual devices. When you have ONOS control over subgraphs, then now the subgraph controller may need to to re-aggregate this information, which we've already decided is difficult to do. Yes, exactly. So I guess my perspective is with the, with the existing intent framework, um, I mean, you could possibly retrofit a solution that would leave partial paths <coughs> intact and potentially like reintroduce other end state intents, like other like flow rule, flow objective style intents that could be handed off. Um, as far as the intent domain question goes, I mean, this is kind of the point, right? You, you, you could delegate this subgraph, which is your optical domain under your Adivar or Infinair or, or whatever controller, um, and then it would be handed um, a primitive to, to realize. And it could do so however it wanted. It could break it up and send it to individual devices, or it could, it could hand the whole thing off to uh, another controller. In terms of retrofitting, uh, so, so, yeah, so, since I have a, that's a question for you guys. Regarding, I, I, I'm not saying that I want to, this um, issue to be solved right now, because we already, uh, as I said, we already made, uh, it, it's working right now, but it's not what we want on a long term. My question is, uh, do you think that the future inter, intent domain can possibly solve it? Um, I mean, Yes. In the vision that you have for the intent domain, if you have uh, an, an, a second layer controller sitting um, below you 
is is there a way to pass the intent directly to that uh, to that domain without compiling it in the in the low, in the high level in the higher honors? That's correct. So the, okay. the thing is, the process of compilation would still be there, or the process of sort of delegation of of the intent to a specific region of the network, or sort of breaking it apart, because you could have a high level intent that spans multiple domains, it could need to be broken up, but but once, the, as uh, basically the idea is that uh, an intent domain will be handed a primitive, and in this case, the intent domain, one of the intent domains could be the Dara or Infinera sort of software hosting, fronting those controllers, and you could simply pass the data around that high-level primitive directly to those controllers. So yes, the, I, the the capability that you're requesting is what the intent domains were intended. Pardon the pun to solve. So, if you okay. do not need a solution in short term, then clearly the recommendation would be to to wait or not or better yet help us develop the main solution um, and okay, perfect. and lean on that. And if in the meantime you know things are working fine, just leave it at that. If you need it in a shorter time frame, then uh, you may need to you know um, you may need to take a look at maybe retrofitting. Um, the the back end of the intent framework, which would be around the intent installer area. There's a there's a the component inside the intent framework called intent installer, and uh, and basically have the compilers produce some high level uh, additional high level primitives in addition to flow objectives or flow rules. Would it uh, like if you have a, a domain controller made by some third party? Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the line, like you're saying, we pass a primitive to it, but somewhere there has to be some adaptation. Yeah, yes, yes, somewhere. Yes, yes. And, and where does that, uh, 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 where does that adaptation fall? Does it fall on the southbound of one that talks to the domain controller, or is it an extension to the domain controller? Uh, yes, sure, sure. Because because you, you see the, the, the domain controller would be responsible for doing adaptation within the subgraph. Yes. That, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is not how, so you have a controller for Juniper switches, right, or whatever, right, or Adva, or whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? Those are closed source uh, controllers, mm -hmm. right? Now, how do we go about, I'm not, I'm not talking about the feasibility of it. I'm talking about the practicality. Yeah. How do we go about doing this? Yes. Right. How do we go about convincing the people who develop this controller to actually support the primitives that we're sending down? Right. Well, well, I mean, yes. I, so, so the, the, the transformation. Problem. So the transformation has to happen somewhere between the the intent controller and 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 the the thing executing the, the intents, right? It, if it's closed source, clearly we can't modify this stuff on the remote side. So there has, the adaptation has to be on Onos side, somewhere within Onos extent, yes. like driver. The south, the south bound. Yes, the south bound. Exactly. So, um, so that's what I was assuming we were talking about in this context. That, that the adaptation will happen somewhere inside Onos, but as a specific pairing between um, the. In, in temporary work southbound and, and and this specific type of control. Yeah. It's, uh, okay, Reg regarding, oh, yeah, sure, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Um, so the, the regarding the, 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 other, the other step, uh, we talk with Andrea Campanella, I think he, he is the main um, developer that work on the, on the rest. Uh, southbound, if I'm if I'm not wrong. Yes. Okay. Um, so I will discuss. We will discuss with him uh, which, which uh, path to take. The the high level question is that: Do you think this um, provider will be useful for you? And uh, I mean, uh, obviously, if we extend the rest of bound, is fine. If we need, if we decide with Andrea to have a new uh, Southbound provider, I will discuss with him. But my question is that: Is, is, is it okay for you if uh, we go ahead and we try to integrate our code into Onos, or do you think that these use cases is, are not relevant to you? No, I, 
I think so. We I, I don't know upfront, but if, if it's reasonably close to what to what the existing provider does, I would just integrate it, of course. Okay. So I will I will talk with Andrea for details, and obviously uh, we will submit the code to get it, so you will have the chance to to have a look at it. Yeah, because, um, because regardless of whether it's for intents or for other things, right? Uh, this is a this is a provider, and so there will be other things that we may need to do through a proxy, and uh, it's, it's it's to be expected, right? Especially when dealing with some of the legacy devices or or aggregate controllers for them. Okay, okay. So thank you guys for it's it's all from from my side. Great. Thanks, Matteo. Thanks, Michele. Uh, let me know how that goes. Um, all right. So I think with that we can work. No, 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 no. So, so is the is the so <laughs> Southbound provider uh, interface when dealing yes. with the intent domain? Yes. Is that same as what we have today? The Southbound provider. So the, the thing is the intent today don't really have a. Southbound provider, right. they, they they lean on flow objectives and flow rules yeah. directly, right. and and yeah, is to not to lean on them directly. Yeah. Is, so is there a layer yes. in between that we already have, or is this something that we need to add? That, that that's we don't we don't have a layer. Okay. We did, but we optimized it out, okay. and then uh, which was the intended storage. Yeah. Um, and now it needs to be reintroduced, uh, okay. but if it's going to be reintroduced in form of intent domain. So intent domain will be basically a, a, a thing that uh, is capable of realizing intent uh, primitives Correct. on a regional network. Okay. Of course, those primitives have to now be decomposed. So let's say, for example, if somebody requests a, a tunnel through a, a regional network, which potentially spans a couple of different domains. Sure. Uh, then it some sort of a uh, macro planning is happening yeah, across yeah. those regions, yeah. and then the intent has to be chopped up, has to be uh, sent to individual domains for realization, yeah. Yeah. and then uh, so that they can be properly stitched together, right? Right, right. okay, okay. Uh, so the sort of the guidance for Mateo is to actually program against like the current salt bone. Uh, yes, if they have a solution that works today, just continue with that solution. Uh, and just simply go ahead through refactoring it to, or, or merging it into the code what, in whatever way is the best. And he and Andrea can decide what that is. And, you know, of course, we will review the code. Um, I think it makes sense to just put it in on a school base. It's not, not an issue. And then uh, help us work on the long term, make sure that the design and the structure of the internal means is done correctly. All right. Okay, so I think with that, we can probably switch the Good. switch topics to talk about the suggestions for TST best practices. So Who should I, I give the... I just dialed in if you want to give it to me. Yes, I'll give that to you. I haven't been taking any notes on, the, on, the, on these things. So I'll probably answer. Do I need to do anything? Show. Sorry, I'm not that familiar with it. My screen? Yes. Or I guess you can also choose one of those. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I already saw it. Okay, there we go. Okay. Um, I don't know if I should move up or what not, or whether people can hear me. There. Is, a, is this microphone live? No, no, it's this one. Oh, that one. Just, 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 just on the edge. <coughs> and uh, if, for those of you who are not sharing this screen, uh, you might take notes. Uh, um, so I guess we uh, this kind of came out of like some conversations and mail threads from like a few weeks back. Um, it's specifically FreeBSD only because I kind of interact with that open source community like outside of OnLab. Um, and for a little while back when we did the community surveys, um, I was kind of trying to go through all of the results that we had gotten back and specifically focusing on docs. 
but really like I kind of like had a few notes here and there so that was kind of you know fresh in my mind and on the meanwhile um, I had recently gone to a FreeBSD Dev Summit and one of the things that they did there was to have this open Q&A session with the uh, core team members from their uh, software project. So the core is kind of analogous to what the TST is. Um, and they happened to have um, this Q&A session and eventually um, I kind of went and yeah, so like um, talked with some of these guys. So um, kind of like the reason why I kind of found it interesting was um, their governance structure is kind of similar to what we have for ONAS if you squint a bit. So you have this, you know, core team member of like nine to 14 people uh, that's kind of equivalent to a TST. Uh, they have these people with commit bits, uh, which are kind of equivalent to our module owners. And then, you know, you have different contributors that might not have commit privileges, but might still do like bug hunting, um, submit patches occasionally, uh, edit docs, so on and so forth. And then we have users. Um, and they're also a pretty long lived community. They're like over 20 years old. Um, so I figured there's things that we can kind of take away from what they've been doing, you know, what they've been doing right, what they think they can do better, uh, so on and so forth. And um, so the rest of these slides don't really focus on FreeBSD, but more kind of like the things that I kind of took away as general ideas from talking to one of their particular core members um, that have ran like two terms, so that's like four years. Uh, and then also I was pointed to their online documentation. So I just decided to throw a link up there. It's pretty thorough with, you know, different kinds of procedures that they have, but, um, you know, just because, you know, they have something that works for them doesn't mean, you know, it, you know, would work for us. So it's just kind of a reference thrown yeah. out there. So it doesn't hurt to, yeah. uh, to right. try to learn yeah. from it and apply it as, it, as, as you sure. see it. Yeah. And just to add to that, I mean, I think since there are communities that have been around, I mean, it's amazing to think that there's a 21 year old community, you know, I think this is an opportunity for us to leapfrog, you know, if there's good ideas, let's just steal them and, and yep. use them, right? So the, the intent here is not to be critical of, oh, we're doing anything wrong, it's just to offer ideas like, oh, maybe we could take sure. these good no, ideas. Of course. Yeah. And, and if this is a discussion people like, you know, Ayaka and I are happy to make this kind of a, a regular series. I think Code for America, Mozilla, there's all sorts of places that have good ideas we, we might want to consider, so. Yep. And I mean, we also had like past, um, Intern, I guess, visiting uh, developers who are also kind of uh, involved in other communities. Like, I think Gian at one point knew a bunch of people from, op like, what was it, OpenStack. So he was talking about documentation techniques that they're using at one point. And so maybe we can even kind of like ask around close to home, but, you know, kind of like a mini series if that's something that's. Sure. Interesting. Great. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, so let us know at the end of this, and we'll be interested if people thought this was useful. Yeah. And then um, one other, oh, sorry, I'll just say one other thing. And we, we kind of frame these as a, as kind of proposals because mm -hmm. we felt like it was an easier thing to get people to respond to. Yes, this is a good idea. No, it's not. Yeah, yeah, sure. So that's just kind of the context. Sorry. Um, so this year was an election year for them. So a lot of the things that came up in this Q&A session uh, was about elections. Uh, so kind of stepping back beforehand, um, one of the things that I thought was really good was that at this dev summit or sometimes even at like general conferences, uh, they would have like a 30 minute slot or something where if they have a bunch of core team members around, they'll make them come up front and, you know, just be like, okay, informal Q and A session, you can ask us anything, we'll try to answer. And um, so they, this kind of helps to increase the transparency. So this was one particular, you know, um, one of those sessions. And um, what they kind of do is, you know, I know that we also had like a list and then some, you know, descriptions about the candidates. Um, but what they kind of do is they also do something similar, which is to have like a personal statement plus, you know, answers to a set of stock questions that um, like um, were provided by their uh, election manager, uh, which is kind of like a temporary position that they have. Um, but I think having like a stock set of questions plus like the statement might also kind of make it a bit more clear about, okay, this is what we're interested in as a project versus this is what these people are interested in pushing as, you know, part of the TST, for example. Um, 
So, quick yeah. question: the the second bullet, or is that what you're getting to right now? Because you, you meant, so on the second bullet, would it be something like getting like the Reddit AMA type session? Yeah, we could do something like that. I think that works generally pretty well. Yeah. So, like, um, that might be one of the things that you might do, but also by kind of volunteering or like um, volunteering yourself as a candidate or nominating someone else, um, what ends up like happening in their case is um, they kind of open themselves up to like this two week or some time delta a slot when they kind of pretty much say, okay, you can interrogate me and ask me questions, you know, on IRC, on email, on, you know, any other means you can walk up to me at a conference, for example, and ask me questions. And that's what they kind of sign themselves up to. And I think that might also kind of become handy as uh, the community grows, and then you might start getting candidates from you know, outside of OnLab and that what we might not be familiar with. So that would also kind of be uh, useful for everyone to learn more about each other and kind of make, I guess, more informed choices. Now, I like what you said about the short-term election manager. I mean, maybe we could pick that person and they would you know, be tasked with sorting out the best way to do it, but the general overview would be like, make sure these candidates are well known in the community. Yeah, so there's two, yeah, so there's okay, two, two things. So th th this one is both, when we're talking about our own elections, right, there, were, there are two things, vetting the voters, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, who's, who can vote, and yeah. also who, who uh, we're voting for. And so certainly this would help with the latter. To be able to provide, you know, to inform the the voting. Um, sure. uh, but you're right. who can vote is a whole nother. Yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> but it, the, yeah, the idea is to inform the voters so they better who they're voting for. Yeah. And, and I wasn't a voter. Yeah. Speaking of that, I wasn't a voter this time around, so I wasn't directly involved. But I did get the sense that the people who did vote didn't necessarily know everything there was to know about every candidate. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So and kind of like, um, yeah. So like it. If you also want to be a candidate, you also have these certain sanity checks that this election manager does, like, oh, have you committed in the recent X number of months? What have you been doing? Those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, it's very well acknowledged that, yeah, finding out how to create this voting body is an open and difficult problem because you might end up kind of ignoring people who are pretty significant in your community but might not have committed. Right. Um, but yeah, like kind of going along with the election cycle with these candidates and these open Q and A's, uh, the TSD members, you know, are the core members. I'm going to kind of just interchange them because they're pretty much analogous uh, for this talk. Um, they would also, you know, they should also be able to answer about what they think about the current election or, you know, what they think about the general procedure if they're asked during these sessions. Um, and overall, I think that would kind of be really great for uh, transparency. So do the, do the participants who want to get these answers, do they directly ask the candidates or is there a moderator they send the questions to and you know, they basically have pull those questions and then get answers that are published? Um, it was basically a free-for-all. Like someone might go, hey, like so-and-so. Um, they were also wearing these, you know, big, huge name tags so you can see their names and, you know, what oh. their positions are. Oh, so this are. is actually a physically co-located thing. This yeah, so this, online. Um, this wasn't this one wasn't on, online, but I'm sure they also had these open forums like um, they use IRC, we use Slack. So it would probably be something on Slack for us or, you know, a mail list or something. Um, so I guess you have an election channel and then just pop in there. If you have exactly. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that seems like a, quite a reasonable and good idea. So, so basically, the first thing would be if you, I'd say, decide to go forward with this, we would have a short-term sort of designate group to take care of some of the logistics <laughs> for this, right? Sounds good to me. Good okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, just like you it jumped a few. There we go. Is that right? Okay. Um, is it? Mm -hmm. There's like four slides. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the second thing that kind of came up um, was that like a lot of the people from the survey seem to kind of not have a clear idea of what exactly the role of the TST is with respect to not just technical, but for like, um, you know, as a face of the ONAS project. 
And um, a lot of the things that came up were like, oh, yeah, it seems like um, there might be some discussions of a technical nature, but things seem to already be decided for us or there's already this implementation that they talk about after the fact. And I think that kind of comes from um, not having a clear, like a more clearly defined um, like definitions. I guess that's kind of a terrible um, it's like you know, looking up a word in the dictionary and says, look, look, this similar word, but um, we haven't really clearly defined what exactly the TST means. Um, so one of the things that kind of came up in the conversation was, okay, so a core member is you know, core and that's just you know, one role, but they're also a developer at the same time. So if this you know, core member decides to work on some significant part of the system, uh, are they doing that on behalf of the core team versus are they doing it that on behalf of themselves? And having that kind of um, separation kind of clearly put out somewhere um, seems to kind of prevent this image of, you know, this micromanagement or, you know, hands-on kind of, um, we already did this, so, you know, um, it's already done, we're not taking feedback, that kind of an image, because then, you know, someone might come up and see this implementation that this core member did and go, okay, this person was working on this as a committer, not as a, you know, a core team member. And kind of having that listed down somewhere along with, you know, several other things like, you know, being committer is one job, but being, you know, TSD is another job. And by being a part of the TSD, you're not only working on code, but you're also, you know, working more on kind of building up like, like this image of the, like the face of the project. And with that, you know, might come other kinds of, you know, implications, which might be, you know, you might do more managerial kinds of things like conflict resolution between two devs, or, you know, if you're working on something, you might have to be a bit clear that you're doing this on your own behalf on, you know, and on, on your own interests. Um, so I guess having maybe like, I guess the discussion point for this slide is, you know, whether we should have some kind of a list something similar to these bullets uh, somewhere on the wiki or like the TST page. Um, and just to throw them up there, like are the disagreements on the, this is what the role actually is or not? I mean, it does seem to, to Ayaka's point, go beyond just being a committer, you know, and, and do we agree on the, these are all points? And I, uh, maybe I need some clarification on what you mean by, you know, when you're working on something, on, are you doing it on behalf of yourself or the core team? Uh, are you by that do you mean to separate like the role of TSD as someone who is essentially doing the non-code thing as well as coding? So I think um, how do I word this? Um, <coughs> I'm having a hard time articulating. Um, so it's like it's kind of like trying to figure out what exactly being TST means, I guess, mm -hmm. and having like. Okay, so being TST means that you're kind of, you know, shepherding how this project, you know, moves forward. But do you do that with by kind of, you know, helping out other people kind of do this versus are you kind of hands on and, you know, if you need some kind of a subsystem implemented, is that like, are you looking for other people to do this and then promote and, you know, foster, you know, someone's activities versus, you know, are you just going to implement it yourself? So, I mean, maybe I'm, I mean, maybe my definition of TST is narrow, but TST is basically just shepherding the architecture and the life of the structure of the system itself, which includes design, architecture designs and code. And therefore, it's one of the, and clearly the last one is not least necessary, right? And they're all required different level of strategy which is tactics. You need both. And so that's one of the reasons why we require TST members to be active committers. So I don't think, I'm not sure I would agree that these are separable. Now there's of course an element of community outreach and community and building that we are engaged in, but it's that's separate. That's not to me, that's not necessarily part of the TST. Part of the TST is really the, the, the focal point here is the structure of the system itself, nothing else. That's how I look at it. Now, maybe I'm to be corrected in what it is, 
that, that's complicated. Well, I wasn't part of your discussion with the person from PSD, but my take on it is, to your point, there's a feedback loop, though, and maybe that gets to that last question about how best to gauge the personality needs of the community. You're not doing that in a vacuum. You know, you need to be, how do we understand what the community is and what it needs? And then, I mean, it's almost like you have constituents. You know, it's almost like representative democracy. You know, you're elected by this body of people. How do you speak on their behalf? Yes, but but the subject here, your subject is is, is the structure of the sure. system. And I'm abbreviating here, but by sure, structure sure. I mean just the, the, the overall health of it, right? Sure. And uh, the, and the but, overall but, health of this project, the, the health of the project is not only its same design or same architecture; it's also the same community. Oh yeah, but but this is technical. But still, it's TST, community. right? There's the community, the community in the team, so it's it's clearly the community. The community is part of the, 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 the technical community. The, the, in the technical aspects of a project, the community has impact. Right? So we cannot we cannot say that like I, at least from my point of view, we cannot say we are the TST. We drive the design in a vacuum without without uh, without sharing that or or accepting fe I, feedback or. Suggestions from the community. Correct. No disagreement there. I did not even mean to imply that other aspects are not considered. I just wanted to make sure that yeah, so clearly, you know, when you're making a decision on or, or making comment on something, you need to be able to separate, you know, the, the non-invented here, for example. You know, I worked on this in the past. Yeah. Um, whether it's as a, I don't see the separation whether it's as a committer or as a TST member. I worked on it, right? And you need to go to be maintain some, some some level of detachment and broader perspective in order to be able to say somebody has a better idea and uh, it should be, you know, we should revisit this or, or do it differently. Of course, that is expected in my opinion and I think those things should be spelled out here. I just want to make sure that we're not <coughs> broadening things out too much sure, for sure. out of the focal point of maintaining this, the focus of this should be on technical steering team. And yes, absolutely agree, Ali, that that involves the community. But I just also I want to make sure that that our work does not necessarily spill into the community team. No, no, I hear that. I hear that. And again, this is a discussion point. I mean, maybe I think Ayaka's point about being explicit about what the role is is a good one. And maybe we need to fine tune what these bullets are. But maybe that's something we can yeah. commit to, like putting up on the page. These, you know, yeah, this so is the explicit role. For sure, it should be. So I'm not at all trying to say we should not be clear yeah. about this. Those things should be clear. I just want to make sure that uh, these bullets might need some work. Yeah, I mean, these are just kind of like example mm -hmm. sort of and, well, you know, and, suggestions. And, and, and they may be perfectly fine. I just want to make sure that they're yeah. taken in the context of the what, what the focal point is yeah. here. So, so I guess like kind of to like step back, like the general idea was, okay, we if we're not clear about uh, what, you know, what, what it means to be, you know, a TSD member, I think a lot of people from outside looking in will kind of start to build up their own image of what it is. And when it doesn't meet that expectation of what they have in their mm -hmm. mind, it kind of ends up being a point of conflict. Sure. And mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the, the feedback I saw was kind of that. Like they were trying to figure out what, you know, what exactly does the TSD do? Like, do they actually, you know, do they push out code as like a benevolent dictatorship? Is it like an oligarchy? Is it, yeah. you know, and people seem to be pretty confused about it. And that's where you get people saying we're not transparent or my voice yeah. isn't really reflected. No, I think that, that, that the two top, well, maybe the two top bullets in the last one are the ones that are, that are, that are, that are more reflecting, like, like the responsibility is being beyond being a committed. Um, yeah, you're not just a super committer. Yeah, you're not just like a yeah, super committer or, 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 or and, uh, and also your responsibility towards the project itself. Right? Yes. It's also like, like are my actions, whether they're in code, in speech, in, in behavior, are they to the benefit of the project or not, right? And that, that should be the tough question when you do anything, at least, at least the way I look at it when I'm out vagabond in the world. Uh, um, uh, uh, I, I think, like, is what I'm saying uh, presenting the project in a good light? Yes. And and not, not and, and to Ayaka's point, that's like, is it, you always have to play this game because because we we have this role now, and we have this relatively large project where people respect us, 
And is it is it is it am I playing my own benefit or am I playing the project benefit? And it's a hard it's a hard question to answer. Oh yeah, yeah, yourself. yeah. Of course, but I, I guess yes. So maybe I made a mistake. I, I'm assuming that that uh, ability to act in a in a way that separates the two is is expected. It is, uh, but, uh, but, but you're right. It has to be necessarily, and, and it probably should be spelled out. Yes, it's not easy, right? Because yeah. it's easier to fall into the into this loop where, like, uh, you know, illusions of grandeur. Right? There's been uh, some amount of unhappiness that it's a requirement to be an, uh, an active committer. So that's that's another thing that I mean. I, I think it's a good, a, a good idea because that makes sure that the person is really grounded in the community and the code. But I just bring it up as just but you could being clear about what the TSD is might help some of those types of comments. Mm -hmm. Right. But let me ask another question. Like, so we define a committer as someone who commits code. Right. What if what if uh, we have some technical reviewer person or someone who is very good at understanding code? And is able to start like going through our code base and start adding documentation on our mm -hmm. code, documentation on our wiki. Or is such a person considered a contributor? Uh, co sorry, considered a committer, because I would, because they've understood the code base. They they might have even a better understanding than I do, right? Uh, which is in in some ways the ability to distill code into English, right, is a is a higher skill than ability to vomit code. Right. I mean, usually, no. <laughs> it so happens that someone who is so good at understanding the code, yeah. most likely will end up doing some commits like one time or another. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think, yes, it's true. if you just go by number of commits, people can easily optimize for that. Yeah. Right? And, and yeah. that's basically a bad situation to be in. I think at the end of the day, you need to have maybe multiple measures that define how yes. you are contributing. I, mean, I, 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 I completely agree. agree. I, yeah. I need to I mean, give an example, though. Yeah. Like an example of, of something that happened like this. I guess it was a code contribution as well. but. So in the thrift community, right? Uh, while a while ago, uh, we had all these like you know compilers to generate all kinds of bindings for different languages. And one guy just said, "No, I'm just going to write a compiler that generates documentation." Right? Um, wasn't like the most uh, you know. It's, it's not like another, another binding for a fantastic language. It was just gener generating HTML pages, right? And he got the most brownie points. Yeah, you see sure, what I'm saying? No, no, sure, I completely agree. And as a matter of fact, one of the architects that I worked at HP really closely for a drone on lab, yeah. she was exactly like that. She not necessarily wouldn't be able to, I mean, she was would able to write code, but she was extremely valuable at looking at other people's code, looking at other people's designs, or, yeah. or even their programming, and to be able to provide extremely valuable input. Sure. So there's absolutely, uh, there needs to be multiple, like my answer, there needs to be multiple different measures. And so, I'm trying to unwind the stack here because we have a little bit of time to get on your point yeah. that you finish. But so yes, yeah, so we should definitely uh, crisp up the definition of the role. I think that's definitely a very, very good idea. And uh, and there's definitely, just to be clear, there, I definitely see the TST role uh, to be beyond just code <coughs> and, uh, beyond and beyond just the technical there is a spillage into the community, but but let, I just want to make sure we don't understand what the focal point is. It's centered on the code, sure. and the structure of the system, mm -hmm. and then it goes from there. Oh, no, definitely. Um, and I guess this is the last page, so I think uh, we are right on time, hopefully. Okay, perfect. Um, so the last bit that um, kind of came up was about the topic of mentoring. So, um, you know, currently a lot of the things that came in, well, this was probably more the docs needing the factor in really badly, but, you know, someone comes in new, they want to start working on ONOS, they don't really quite know where to start. And right now, if someone's not sitting here and kind of, you know, getting hands-on help, it's quite difficult for, you know, someone to really, you know, start up very quickly and to start contributing. Um, you know, there's, there's, you know, exceptions to that, but it's still a bit, like, too rare for, it, like, it, it shouldn't be as unusual or, you know, notable, like, um, because it's like a distributed project, but uh, so one of the things that they really emphasized was um, having this implicit mentorship system. Uh, so you kind of overheard, sorry, no. like you were, you were kind of overhear, you know, people talking about, oh yeah, you know, like I'm mentoring, you know, so and so many people. Um, you know, they, the general consensus is, you know, you as a committer, you know, you should bring in X new committers, you know, X being some arbitrary number. Um, 
and the implied life cycle is basically you come in as a user, you start contributing things, you know, maybe you do bug reports, you do patches, eventually you become a committer, and then you might, you know, become, you know, a mentor. And um, what mentors do is kind of, you know, be on the lookout for contributors who seem to be, you know, kind of, I was about to say the word egregious because that's how the person described it to me, <laughs> but, um, you know, very noticeable. Um, so they're, you know, throwing in patches, doing docs, those kinds of things. And um, if they seem to be very active and committed to the project, you know, a mentor would go up to, say, the core, you know, the core team going, hey, this person seems to be very, you know, involved. Um, can we give them a commit bit? Um, and after that, they get, you know, they get an okay. Uh, it's mostly up to the mentor to bring the person up to speed. So it kind of offloads a lot of the, the um, I forgot the word for it. Um, the um, orientation, I guess, into the project. Um, it, it kind of that part gets offloaded from the core member to that mentor. Um, and, you know, of course, that mentor isn't always going to be in the same room as them. In fact, you know, like as the mentee, like they can be, you know, across the, uh, across the globe. And, you know, if the person that they're mentoring, you know, posts a question to a mailing list, it's more on them to answer them or to help them out or to check out, you know, a patch that they submitted. So it kind of, like, um, it kind of becomes a responsibility of the mentor to make sure that that person you know, gets to the point where they can be reliably given a commit bit and be trusted with, you know, you know actually contributing to the project. And I think the tangible thing I'm here, I mean, it's easy to say mentoring is great and it's a good way to share knowledge and we should do more of it, but I think the tangible kind of action item is can we set expectations that module owners should be acting as mentors? Like part of the role of being a module owner is to make sure that knowledge about that module is spread throughout the community. Um, you know, sorry, you were going to oh, say yeah, yeah. So, so I have sort of one one concern. I completely agree with, with your, your your final assertion that the why is this relevant. Um, but I sort of see the, I see two separate problems in the current issue. Um, I, the one is almost can be confusing, hard to find information to get started. Um, I think that could potentially be solved with mentorship, but there are other pathways I think that we should also consider, like more tutorials, better documentation, uh, maybe more like get started, meet up type things. And, and the reason I suggest that is because mentorship is actually really, really expensive in terms of someone's time. And you know, if we say that all we want to do is just like, you know, have all the module owners and committers and, and other folks be more mentors, it sort of becomes a tragedy of a commons when the first problem is that almost is confusing and I can't get started. And so I, I think really for me, the, the role of a mentor should be trying to bring active contributors to the point where they can become committers. Yeah. Because that shows that someone's already like spent some time invested in the project, they've like started using it, and like now they're like actually actively trying to contribute it, to it. And at that point, like how can we like even make them more engaged? How can we kind of grow them and their their sort of relationship with the community? Yeah. I totally hear you, and I don't actually think these things are at odds. I don't think it's an either or. I mean, I, and I think that's where that last sub bullet point about the mentoring in any ge geography becomes really critically important. I think one of the reasons we don't have some of these other tutorials and uh, walkthroughs and what have you is because we're kind of biased towards mentoring in person, and it's just so much easier to sit down and kind of talk to somebody. But if you had to go through the motions of communicating with somebody in Tokyo, you would create all these artifacts because you have you can't they're not sitting here next to you you can't just hand it off to them that way. No. So, so sorry, sorry. I keep on to you. But I, I think these complement. If you if you commit to mentoring people outside of the office, you end up with some of these documents. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to. Sorry, I have a problem in life. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but 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 uh, I actually think if mentoring someone takes less time when it's uh, when you are in different jobs. Than when you are face to face, yeah. because if you are in a co-located, the pers person you're mentoring, unless they're very reasonable people, will will, <laughs> will, will, will will try to will try to a very reasonable person will try to do on their own, and then when they can't figure it out, will come to you. 
most people will have the reaction, well, I don't know how to do this, I'm going to blast it. And it's going to take ages. Like, so you're going to, your, your, your iteration is much, is much, uh, much tighter. But towards a different geography somewhere else, uh, they're forced to work on their own because there are times of the day where you're sleeping. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Latencies are high. Right. <laughs> Latencies are higher, you're, you're forced to. And, and, um, and I think also mentoring is like, it's, it's a very unrewarding process because you're going to, for every 10 people you mentor, you're going to get one. Wow. Exactly. And that's okay, right? So you've wasted your time. It's kind of like, you know, a blockbuster movie, you know, that, uh, like you, 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 you make a whole load of shitty movies and you get one great one, right? And even that. Uh, and so, and so it's same, it's the same thing, right? So you have to, you have to accept the fact that like your, your return on investment is going to be extremely low. Uh, and and that's, that's in terms of numbers, but you know, the long term yeah. effect is yeah, the long term, the long term effect, effect will be multiplied, yeah. multiplied, mm -hmm. but the, the, your own time yes. as, a, as an yes. individual will be crappy. Yes. Right? And and that's okay. Right? Yeah. There's nothing sure. wrong with that. I mean, well, you, and you output, also, productivity output in terms of the. The, the, at least the, the coding or whatever other effort you were doing is going to be impacted. Sure. <laughs> That's life. But I would also go back to Brian's point. I think if we kind of bake this into the expectations for module owners and there is some pain associated with it, that's just even more incentive to have more module owners, which I think we all agree is a good thing to have anyway, right? So it might be a nice forcing function to nominate and, and kind of expand the module owner pool if we're feeling some mentoring pain. I mean, again, like this kind of mentoring isn't strictly enforced, you know, no, I understand, Either. I understand, but no. just it would be expected oh. to roll, right? It's yeah. so something that you yeah. have there, there explicit be, about. Yeah. In this, I'm not saying, yeah. Okay. yeah, of course, I don't think anybody here was expecting a sort of enforcement. No, no, it's setting way. the expectations. Yeah, setting expectations. Yeah. So it's kind of like someone going, hey, this person's, you know, pushing in really quality patches. Can't, you know, let me, you know, recommend them yeah. as a new committer or but, a new module yeah. owner. But I would also go back to what Brian said in one of his earlier comments is we should fish for these with these people to mentor only among those people already show initiative. Oh yeah, no, of course. Because yeah. otherwise that that will sort of increase the odds of, of getting somebody who's gonna run with things. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I mean like for, in, in their case as well, like they're already focusing on people who are submitting packages or you know, submitting documentation. So it's already, you know, people that are past the certain hurdle. Um, not just random people. Yeah, who it's show not up just to, yeah, whoever that shows up or so we're, uh, hi, hi, this is this is Murat. I, I and in the uh, honors project, there is also the ambassador program, right? Uh, I think the ambassadors can manage the mentors. What do you think? That's a very you're right. Ambassadors, yeah, we're being we're setting expectations with ambassadors as well to be mentors. That's a good point. Thank you. So um, we're coming we're about the top of the hour, but just to. So this is your last slide, yeah, you said? This is so I think if you were to sort of summarize a couple of, there were essentially three different areas. So one would be, uh, if I recall correctly, one would be around the, uh, basically, the election process. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure there's more transparency, more information about the potential candidates. Mm -hmm. And that, that uh, could be run through basically like the temporary um, uh, election manager. Uh, do you envision that, that Person would come from the ranks of the TST, or would from it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, yeah. you, could you like, but say, could you could be something that you could provide, or somebody? I, I or, think we could almost even just ask the community and put a you know okay. a role description up, if okay. you will, and see if somebody steps up. So, I mean, that's that seems to me um, that seems like a good idea to try to do that this time around, and um, and see how that uh, how that goes and adjust from there. Yeah. Right? So let's let's do that. Uh, then uh, the, the second part was about being more clear about the TST roles mm -hmm. and um, and so the expectations that are for TST members to be more explicit mm -hmm. so that uh, not only necessarily for the benefit of the TST members but also mm -hmm. actually more so for the benefit of the community yeah. so that they understand what their yeah. role this body plays. Exactly. Right. Uh, and then the last part is to talk about the, um, uh, the, the mentorship. And then the action for the TST role, maybe somebody from the TST wants to take a pass at those bullets if they think that's Yes, tweaking. okay, yes, you, you're right. And I think for this, uh, the, the idea would be, I guess, to draw, start drawing from the um, governance process, right, which already has some description of the roles, I would assume. Yeah, maybe it's already there and just not and communicated broadly enough to those people. And I mean, you talk to me, you just add to it. Yeah. Um, okay. 
and then if I guess it not only necessary then feed it back to the um, governance process. Yeah. And then for mentoring, maybe that's a longer a longer discussion because like to Brian's point, there's a lot to knowledge transfer and, and it's not necessary. And maybe mentoring the bigger topic is more knowledge transfer, but mm -hmm. but I mean this is a way to address that, you know. Yeah. And I, I would separate the I would separate the confu almost confusion and how to get information. I think that's a slightly separate. Yeah, okay, maybe the bottom part is the yeah yeah, yeah exactly yes. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's like the bootstrapping portion that we're not quite getting yet, yes. and then there's the mentoring portion to yes. that. Exactly. Figure out. Yeah. No, this this all seems really reasonable. Good ideas. Good. We should exploit that. And do we want to hear other ideas from other communities that people like yeah. these discussions? I, 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 think, I think so, yeah. I mean, I don't think that's, uh, you know, those are things that, the, the, uh, these aspects of culture. It's not true. Can't both be landed, right? Yeah, cool. Great. Um, yeah, I think you know, thank also. You. Yeah. Thank you both. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Ayaka. Well, thank you for the, for the time, I guess. Yeah, no, this is great. Thanks. So, are we going to conclude the meeting uh, next once? It's going to be next week at 4 o'clock. All right, talk to you later. <laughs>